Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another in the series of briefings organized by the Civil Society Unit in the Department of Global Communications. My name is Jeff Brez, and I am the Chief of the Civil Society and Advocacy Section, Department of Global Communications. Today's briefing, Stigma, Fighting Stigma, Xenophobia, Hate Speech, and Racial Discrimination Related to COVID-19, is co-organized with another part of our department, the Education Outreach Section, which runs mandated outreach programs on the history of the Holocaust and the transatlantic slave trade. With the onset of COVID-19, our activities in the civil society unit with civil society have focused on three things. First, provide information about access to UN meetings and events. Um, with the closure of the, the UN um, premises, uh, NGOs really are thirsty for knowledge about where are the opportunities still for participation, which events will be happening, uh, etc., uh, which are canceled, which are postponed. So we are providing all of that information on our websites and also making sure that civil society around the world can stay connected with us and uh, be aware of the opportunities they have to participate in high level events, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, second, we've issued a call uh, to share stories about how civil society is responding to COVID-19 around the world and to encourage that collectively we act on science, share solutions and inspire solidarity. We know that CSOs around the world, whether or not they had a, a, a health background, have just seen the needs in their communities, identified them and quickly gotten to work on, on addressing uh, needs, uh, urgent needs. And we have dozens and dozens of, of wonderful examples from around the world. Uh, and we're posting them on our website. Uh, we have examples of NGOs in, really all around the world, Latin America, the USA, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, Africa, Asia, um, Middle East, working on, for example, providing services, food and medicine for children with special needs, making sure that those, those services um, do not get interrupted because of the the pandemic, um, distributing masks, hygiene kits, and food um, in uh, you know where there are needy families and needy communities, um, public service announcements um, to uh, um, get communities ready for the possibility of issues with food security, uh, providing house cleaning supplies. Uh, we have NGOs working on voting rights uh, with. Um, elections coming up in some uh, countries and places, sterilization campaigns for places of worship, uh, supporting health clinics, and so many more uh, wonderful examples. So please uh, visit our website, un.org slash civil society, and share with us what your NGO is doing, uh, and we will share it with the world. We want it to be a global uh, sort of sharing of information and experiences, and uh, really inspire others also to implement their solutions. Third, and this is very much related to our discussion today, we are about to launch a quick civil society survey on misinformation about COVID-19 to combat misinformation, stigma, hate, speech, and myths, which unfortunately are rampant these days. We're asking civil society globally to let us know what is happening out there so we can address it through our own UN communications and also in partnership with you, our civil society partners. The survey will be available in all UN languages plus, plus Portuguese. We will make that um, available to you, the link. Uh, we're just in the process of adding the translations to the link, uh, but the link is actually live in English, uh, Spanish and Portuguese so far. Uh, Arabic, Chinese, French, Russian and Spanish are coming uh, in the next day or two. So please uh, share that uh, with your networks and also, um, you know, all of you, uh, uh, on behalf of your NGOs, if you could uh, also take uh, the the uh, survey and share uh, information about misinformation where you're working. Uh, another objective of that uh, survey is to sort of reach out to civil society around the world and ask them to actively become involved in sharing accurate information uh, from, um, for example, the WHO website about how to protect yourselves and others and information about the UN response from un.org slash coronavirus. So our survey is linked to the Secretary General's call on May 8th. He issued an appeal to address and counter hate speech in which he said, quote, 
COVID-19 does not care who we are, where we live, what we believe, or about any other distinction. We need every ounce of solidarity to tackle it together. Yet the pandemic continues to unleash, unleash a tsunami of hate and xenophobia, scapegoating and scaremongering, end quote. So together we are clearly in a critical moment and hope that today's conversation will bring us together in solidarity. Please again, share the survey with your network of NGO partners and thank you in advance for your work and for your partnership. Um, just a reminder, as you may have seen it on the, the slide at the beginning, but the two hashtags that we are using are hashtag UN with civil society and hashtag COVID-19. Now I'm pleased to hand over to today's moderator, Tracy Peterson. She is also the manager of the Holocaust and the United Nations Outreach Program. Tracy, over to you and thank you from me to all of our speakers and again to all of you out there for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you much, very much, Jeff. Uh, today's uh, briefing, and welcome uh, everyone. Today's briefing is in observance of the International Day of Living Together in Peace and takes place in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 crisis extends beyond the arena of physical health, as we all know. The pandemic has revealed with devastating clarity the fault lines that exist in society, and the inequalities that continue to be perpetrated. Furthermore, fear of the virus, coupled with disinformation, creates the perfect environment for prejudice to grow and be strengthened. Conspiracy theories flourish and are spread at lightning speed through social media. Age old stereotypes and tropes are recruited and refashioned to scapegoat, stigmatize and demonize groups some for the first time, but most that have in the past been targeted. Expressions of prejudice and racism against people from Asia and of Asian descent, from Africa and of African descent, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, homophobia, prejudice against the aged, the disabled and the ill is multiplied online, a secondary virus of hate. All forms of discrimination have elements in common. And there are also differences that need to be understood if we are to grasp the complex history and deeply rooted traditions of othering in our society. We need to consider carefully what we can learn from past experiences of responding to discrimination and prejudice. There needs to be an awareness of the tropes that get used by supremacists to encourage hatred. Learning how these tropes have been employed in the past and challenged is an essential part of a strategy to challenge hatred, not only during the time of the pandemic, but in the world that emerges from the immediate crisis. Thus, the Holocaust and the United Nations Outreach Program, which I manage, is engaged in supporting education and remembrance about the Holocaust and the anti-Semitism that fueled the genocide against European Jewry. The Holocaust illustrates with devastating clarity the impact of racism going unchallenged. The notion that certain human beings are not only inherently unequal, but even anti-human was allowed to fester and was nurtured to justify the systematic murder of six million Jewish women, men and children by the Nazis and their collaborators. Teaching and learning about the oldest hatred as anti-Semitism anti is often referred to and how it mutates as a virus is an essential tool in the dismantling of intolerance, not only because it is important for all individuals, politicians, teachers, civil society, governments and institutions to be able to recognize it, but also because in studying it, one understands hopefully the very real consequences such prejudice holds for the victims. To quote the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, Mr. Ahmed Shahid, anti-Semitism is toxic to democracy and poses a threat to all societies if left unaddressed, end of quote. If we are to build a world in which all can thrive with dignity and in peace, 
then we have to attend to all expressions of hatred as a threat to all of us. We are all hurt by racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, homophobia, prejudice against the disabled, the aged, xenophobia. Similarly, Mr. Robert Lauder, president of the World Jewish Congress, wisely stated that coronavirus should bring us all together, not divide us by promoting hatred. This is a significant challenge. The reports issued by the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL, the American Jewish Congress, the AGC, JC, the report commissioned by the UK government's anti-Muslim hatred working group, the reports of discrimination against LGBTQ communities, against people of Asian descent and of African descent and of Africans, reveal only too plainly how COVID-19 is being weaponized against minority groups, dehumanizing and demonizing these groups as vectors of the virus or as the virus itself, calling for action to be taken against these groups, including the annihilation of these groups. Using COVID-19, Holocaust denialists and distortionists have found a new way to undermine the historical truths of the Holocaust. There are reports of attacks on these groups targeted by hate speech. Supremacists don't discriminate, they target all considered undesirable by them. Unlike the new COVID-19, the prejudice expressed is not new. Anti-Semitism can be traced back centuries and as research and experience has shown, has not dimmed over time in its deathly poison. COVID-19 takes place in the context of an international trend of growing anti-Semitism. Expressions of anti-Semitism and hate-related attacks and crimes, for example, in the United States in 2019, were the highest reported in the States in the last four decades. A week ago in Brooklyn, for example, New York, a couple was arrested for a hate crime after allegedly attacking three Hasidic men, trying to rip their face masks off and accusing them of causing the spread of coronavirus in New York City. As countries and cities gradually open their doors again, what impact will be felt in targeted communities? What are we doing to build resilience to the messages of hate? Today's briefing is the continuation of an ongoing conversation about how to counter hatred and to build solidarity and compassion. The panel of speakers invited today represents some of the groups that are being targeted. For that reason, the Holocaust and the United Nations Outreach Program in partnership with similar, similar education programs will be holding a series of online conversations, drawing on the experiences of responders to discrimination in the past in period of crisis, including a focus on strategies to counter hate speech online in the era of COVID-19. As Jeff kindly indicated, I am also serving as moderator for today's discussion. And so I will now put on my moderator's hat to address you as such. We look forward to as engaging a conversation with you today as is possible considering the limitations of an online platform. Please use the chat board to enter your questions and statements at any time during the presentation. And we will endeavor to address as many as time allows. When you write your question, please begin by stating your affiliation. What is the name of the, of the NGO to which you belong or if you're a student and so on. Please indicate to whom your question is addressed. And it will also be great to know from what corner in the world you are writing. It is now my pleasure to welcome Mr. Yezhong Yang. Yezhong, a second year master's student at Rutgers University, is currently interning in the Civil Society and Advocacy Section, Department of Global Communications. We look forward to your input, Mr. Young, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much to Jeff and Tracy for your remarks and introduction, and great thanks to my dear colleagues from Civil Society Unit and Educational Outreach Section at Department of Global Communications for offering me the chance to share my thoughts on such a meaningful and self-related topic. Your Excellencies and dear colleagues, my name is Yi Zhong Yang, come from China, graduated from Rogers University as an international student and currently an intern at Civil Society Unit at Department of Global Communications, United Nations. To begin with, I would like to share my own experience. At the end of January, 
I returned to United States from China, and after I landed at JFK Airport in New York City, I will mask because I know this could help protect myself. And I met a guy on the air train. He shouted at me, go back to your country with virus, even though the COVID-19 hasn't influenced the United States yet at that time. So racism and physical attacks on Asians and people of Asian descent have spread with the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, these groups and communities have been targets of derogatory language in media reports and statements by politicians, as well as on social media platforms, where hate speech related to COVID-19 also appears to have spread extensively. I was surprised to hear that a Chinese was pushed to track from the platform and subway just because he wore a mask. Some politicians use of the term Chinese virus and Wuhan virus may have encouraged those negative influence towards Asian or Chinese communities. So this brings us to reflect the stigma, xenophobia and hate speech accompanying with COVID-19 pandemic around the world. Crowds are easily overwhelmed by the massive hate speech oriented misinformation that tend to simply go drift. One of the reasons that stigma still exists is because some people lack the ability to view such truths or to look independently at facts and to not judge others without bias. Fortunately, we are witnessing people taking actions at international level. International organizations such as WHO and the United Nations are acting to respond to racial discrimination and misinformation. The UN Committee responsible for monetary compliance with the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which 182 countries have ratified, has recommended that governments adopt national action plans against racial discrimination. Plans should lay out specific approaches to combat racism and discrimination, from enhanced police and hate crimes to public messaging and education programming encouraging tolerance. Meanwhile, at state level, member states' governments need to take urgent action to adopt new plans to address the wave of COVID-19 racism and xenophobia. On the other hand, as for international students, while being mindful of and protecting ourselves from xenophobia phenomenon, we should deal with it rationally. There are various differences between criticize and hate speech. We firmly say no to unwarranted racial discrimination. Indeed, most of the people I met here are pretty rational and nice, thus they don't provoke or judge with stereotype. The existing, the existing goal of safety is safety, not stigma. The real enemy is coronavirus, not Asian people. The only solution is unity and solidarity, not xenophobia or discrimination. I am grateful to contribute with such a world caring United Nations. Thus, I spare no effort on works at United Nations, just like this speech, because I know I care and I wish then I do. Nowadays, Everyone is questioning what can individual global citizens do for world peace. I say peace is far more than anti-war. On, on spiritual level, fighting stigma, xenophobia and racial discrimination also mean fighting for peace. And it requires genuine actions based on science rather than sitting and talking. Racial discrimination, racial discrimination should be, have been killed long time ago. But it, has relate, but it has lasted for centuries and may last longer. From now on, I hope we fight for promoting tolerance, unity and peace, not only when there is epidemic, not only when there is a crisis, but at every ordinary moment on every piece of land, every kind of people are able to live and speak conscien conscientiously, friendly and freely. I thank you very much and I will leave the floor to moderate Ms. Tracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zhejiang. That was so heartfelt and, and really, I think, a uh, very important uh, intervention. Also, thank you so much for, experience, uh, for sharing your experiences with us. Uh, it's the personal story that illuminates 
so often the statistics or the headlines and has great value. So thank you for sharing that with us. <clears throat> I would now like to welcome our next speaker, Mr. Craig McIver, who is the director of the United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights in the New York office. Mr. McIver is an international lawyer and specialist in human rights law, policy and methodology, who has spent four decades in the international human rights movement, including more than 27 years at the United Nations. He is currently, as I've said, director of the New York office of the U UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And he has held senior UN positions in Geneva, New York and in the field and has undertaken human rights missions to dozens of countries across Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Eastern Europe and Latin America. We are very pleased to have you with us today, Mr. McIver, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy, and thanks to Jeff and Yuzhong for their, I think, excellent opening comments um, as well. There are five points I'd like to address in just a, a few minutes here, beginning with um, a few uh, points on what we're seeing in the racist reaction to the global pandemic as it has uh, unfolded. And I want to say that this pandemic has not created racism and discrimination. What it has done basically is to peel away the veneer in our societies that was covering over an already simmering uh, racism just under, just under the surface. And what we've seen in the first instance, and as we've already heard, is a lot of acts of blatant racism against Chinese persons, persons of East Asian uh, descent. Across the globe, this is a, a global reality. We've seen racist scapegoating, racist conspiracy theories, uh, anti-Chinese conspiracies, anti-Semitic cons conspiracies and others. Very racialized political speech as well. We've all seen attempts by politicians to rename a virus that already had a name of COVID-19 or novel coronavirus to the Chinese virus, for, uh, for example. Uh, and once again, we also see a very familiar pattern here of politicians and the media trying to tell us who we should hate and who we should fear. It's very familiar to us. We've seen in the last 20 years a series of shifts in this regard. First, we should hate the Muslims, then we should hate the Mexicans, then the migrants, then the Russians, and now apparently it is the Chinese and other persons of East Asian descent. And clearly this has to stop if we're going to get a handle on this thing. It won't stop on its own. So I think that's a call to action for all of our civil society uh, partners. But even worse than all of this around the globe, we've actually seen hate speech of the most vulgar and dangerous kind uh, emerging during the pandemic and actual brutal racist violence being uh, per perpetrated against individuals just on the base of their ethnic um, identity. Once again, I, I think um, not only have we seen this now directed against uh, Chinese persons, persons of Chinese descent, East Asian persons, but also we've seen the targeting of other minorities in many parts of the world against Muslims in particular, um, following this global wave of Islamophobia that uh, has characterized very much, unfortunately, our age. The second point I want to talk about is the degree to which we are seeing uh, also very worrying uh, racism and discrimination in enforcement measures adopted by states around the world to respond to the pandemic. And I want to start by saying that international human rights law is very clear that even under states of emergency, all measures that are taken have to be non-discriminatory. They cannot disproportionately impact on or discriminate against uh, minorities on the basis of race, uh, language, religion, and other factors. And yet, we saw as states and belatedly started to implement their emergency measures, all too often they put in, mo in motion racist, discriminatory, and abuse uh, abusive law enforcement steps as well, inevitably targeting minority communities. Um, the only way that will end, we think, is by ensuring that there's redress for victims when it occurs and accountability for perpetrators, including when that happens in, in law enforcement. Thirdly, uh, as I said in the beginning here, this is not something that was created by the pandemic. The racist underpinnings of our societies has very much been laid bare. Structural racism is what is providing the fertile soil that allows the spread of the virus. And then racism in the response actually exacerbates uh, uh, the virus itself and its spread around the world. So we know from the public health professionals that there are three categories of heightened vulnerability to infection, to serious illness, and to death 
as a result of this pandemic. Those are age, persons in senior age, underlying medical conditions, and lower socioeconomic status. And what we know is that those two latter factors, underlying medical conditions and lower socioeconomic status, track very closely in our societies with minority status, with race, with ethnicity, uh, and so on. Many of the underlying medical conditions are actually products of structural racism in our societies. And if you do a right to health analysis in accordance with the uh, international human rights law again, you see that a big factor here is this idea of the underlying determinant of health being in place. Where that isn't the case, and we can identify uh, health disparities, we know that too is a product of racism in our societies. We also know that economic stress, persecution in, induced stress for particular communities, for example, uh, uh, where there are patterns of abusive law enforcement, health harmful environments, environmental racism, the lack of decent housing, nutritional access, healthcare access, access to jobs and livelihoods, or even reliance on public transportation, those disproportionately affect people in minority communities. And as a result, they're being hit much harder, both by the virus itself and the economic and social consequences of the virus. Um, often persons in this uh, lower uh, socioeconomic status are working frontline jobs with little labor protection, less likely to work in the kind of jobs where there's flexibility, where you don't have to show up um, uh, for your job, and that they are suffering significant disparities in health incomes across lifetimes, even across generations. Um, add to that higher rates of unemployment, mass incarceration and homelessness uh, that disproportionately affect these communities. I think you can see the structural in underpinnings uh, of discrimination. And in this way, structural racism has actually contributed to higher rates of infection, more serious illness and death as a result of COVID-19. Fourth point I wanted to make, Tracy, was on the issue of xenophobia and the targeting of migrants. We see migrants have been particularly vulnerable to stigma, xenophobia, and hate speech during this period, to the loss of their jobs, discrimination, exclusion from pandemic relief programs, obstruction in getting into countries or in applying for asylum, or even for returning home because of border closures. We have 167 countries now that have closed their borders. 57 of those don't even make exceptions for refugees, for those who want to apply for asylum. And thousands have been pushed back. Uh, many are held in overcrowded conditions and refugee camps, and refugee camps and other facilities um, and excludes from social protection, as I've, uh, as I've said before. Finally, I just want to point to some of the things that we can do. In the first instance, we need to look hard at the responses, at the preparations and at the policies that are being adopted and make sure that governments are taking human rights based approaches that focus on the participation of the affected communities on accountability. Uh, of state actors on non-discrimination and equality, on empowerment of those communities, uh, and on an explicit link to their, their human rights uh, across the board. Secondly, data collection and disaggregation is essential. Good policy, including public health policy, comes from evidence on the one hand and from our values like human rights and equality on the other. That has not been largely the basis for much of the policies have been adopted. We need to make sure we have better data for that. We need to strengthen our racist, uh, anti-racist law policy and institutions. We need to organize against this rising tide of ethno-nationalism uh, that has emerged all around the world. And we have to build back better. This is a chance to get to the roots of structural racism in our societies, to undo the damages of four decades of neoliberal economic policies, to make sure that there is universal, non-discriminatory, free health care for everybody without discrimination. It's a time to invest in public education and information so we can combat the misinformation, uh, disinformation and hate speech that has been promulgated all around the world. And in our plans for reopening or phased return to, uh, to, to some normalcy, we need to make sure that policies that sacrifice the most vulnerable on behalf of the most privileged are not tolerated by any of us. We have to say no and we have to insist on adequate protection being in place before any reduction of public health measures. And finally, just to close to say, solidarity is the best vaccine uh, against the virus of racism. When you see it, stand up with your brothers and sisters in the Chinese or East Asian or Muslim or other targeted communities, stand up, speak up and push back and say, this is not our approach to public health. Thanks very much, Tracy. Thank you.
uh, Mr. McIver, those words were very powerful. Uh, in South Africa during the struggle against apartheid, um, a well-known phrase comes to mind now as you were speaking, and it is that an injury to one is an injury to all. And so uh, we, we heed your call for solidarity. It's now my pleasure to introduce our, new, our next speaker, uh, Ms. Janice Mathis, who is the Executive Director of the National Council of Negro Women. Uh, Ms. Mathis was appointed Executive Director of the National Council of Negro Women, as I said, in 2016. NCNW was founded in 1935 and is an affiliation of 32 national women's organizations, 200 campus and community-based sections, with a total membership of more than 2 million women and men. Ms. Mathis has also won uh, a number of awards, and it's including the R. E. Thomas Civil Rights Award. It is our great pleasure to have you with us today, Ms. Mathis. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Mathis will be uh, speaking via a, a, a telephone, uh, and but we are sure that the, the sound quality will be good. Thank you very much, Ms. Mathis. Over to you. Thank you very much. I want to thank the UN Department of Global Communications and particularly Ms. Crystal Frischella and Joe and the entire team at the Department of Global Communications and especially Fanny Munlin, who some of you may know for her tireless effort being our representative of the NCNW at the United Nations. This briefing today, fighting stigma, xenophobia, hate speech, and racial discrimination related to COVID-19 could not come at a better time. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should pause to recognize a day when we dedicate ourselves across the globe to living together in peace. I am reminded of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, the founder of the National Council of Negro Women, as already has been said in 1935, almost 85 years ago, in December, we will celebrate our 85th anniversary. And throughout that time, almost nine decades, the National Council of Negro Women has fought for human rights and fought against stigma and xenophobia. In this current pandemic, it has become more apparent than ever before, especially in the United States, that people of color and people of African descent and people of Latin descent are bearing a disproportionate burden of the trials of COVID-19. And some of that failure is of our own making because unfortunately there are leaders in this country who insist on blaming others for the predicament. Blame the Chinese, blame the African-Americans for their status of health, blame the Latinos, anything other than let's face this pandemic together so that we can survive it together. As you may know, as it has occurred in countries around the globe, we've been asked to distance ourselves from each other, to stay inside, to stay away from work. But I would be remiss if I did not point out that for many Americans, it is impossible to distance and stay apart because of the economic stratification in this country, only one in five African Americans has a job that can be done from home. And so when I look out my window from the comfort of my den, the garbage man who collects the garbage comes every week. The pizza delivery guy comes anytime he is called. The mail is delivered every day. It is only a thin slice of Americans who have the privilege because they have the jobs that allow them to stay at home and be safe and secure inside their own homes. We must begin to address the global and the systemic discrimination and racism that keeps certain parts of the population stratified in jobs that are not technically savvy. I am reminded that Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune in 1945, when the UN opened its session, was the only woman of African descent who was part of the US delegation. 
Certainly we have made progress since 1945, but there is a war that is still going. Today we are in another sort of war, a war for truth, a war for compassion, and a war for the civil and humane treatment of our people. It is important for us to realize that health care is a human right. It is not something for the wealthy only, something for the white only, but something if you're born a human being anywhere on the globe, you ought to have the right to have this type of health care that would protect you from the conditions that make surviving COVID-19 even more difficult. So I would say to all of you today, continue to fight, continue to stand in solidarity. Those of us who believe that we can live on this globe in peace outnumber those who practice xenophobia and racism and hateful speech. We must be strong and determined in our desire to have the world face these dilemmas in a different, more humane and global perspective. I want to thank you again for this opportunity. You can always count on National Council of Negro Women to stand with you. We represent peace, we represent solidarity, we represent equality of all humans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Nathas. We now go to our next speaker, who is Ms. Andrea Chu, who will share her experiences of working for Asian Americans advancing justice to combat racial discrimination in the context of COVID-19. Ms. Chu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you to the UN Department of Global Communications for having me, and thank you so much to Ms. Mathis and the previous speakers for their insights. Uh, again, my name is Andrea Chu, and I'm the Chicago and Midwest Regional Organizer at Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago, which is part of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, an affiliation of five civil rights organizations located across the U.S. in L.A., San Francisco, Chicago, Atlanta, and D.C. Um, at Advancing Justice Chicago, we've seen a dire situation for many people in our city. Um, and like in most places, we see COVID-19 exacerbating existing inequalities. Uh, where in the U.S., uh, use, uh, race is such a fundamental factor, many of these inequalities fall along racial lines. As of a few weeks ago, the Black population of Chicago accounted for almost 70% of COVID-related deaths, despite only being 30% of the population. Um, and Latinx communities now have the highest infection rates in the city. Many of these folks um, are essential workers that put them at near constant risk of exposure, but also have many existing risk factors like living in environmental justice communities or having underlying health conditions. Um, of course, not by choice. Uh, as Craig mentioned, these are actually products of structural inequality. Uh, what most people don't realize is that Asian Americans will also fall under this category. For example, the Philippine X community has uh, high numbers of people working in healthcare and as care workers in Chicago and have been very hard hit by the pandemic. Many Asian Americans are restaurant workers, grocery store workers, etc. Um, and language access, an issue that our linguistically diverse community faces in the best of times, is now a barrier for getting the resources and information that they need. Uh, and not to mention, undocumented Asian Americans have also been left out of the U.S. federal stimulus. As early as January before COVID had even started to take hold in the U.S., businesses in Chicago's Chinatown tanked. Uh, we've seen precipitous increase in discrimination and harassment, uh, often with regard to mask wearing. Uh, people in our community are getting jeered at, spit on, and attacked on the street. Asian Americans are fearful. And as the shelter in place orders lift, we expect that there will be more and more opportunities for aggression against Asian Americans. And we know that smaller incidences of discrimination can quickly escalate. Uh, we see this as a reaction not only to an irrational fear about uh, uh, contracting disease from Asians, which is a very historical yet generally unfounded fear, um, but also as a part of greater economic anxiety that white people in the US feel, uh, and that is manifesting in violence. The xenophobia and racism is taking many forms. Uh, so for example, we've heard stories from our community members of street harassment and rideshare drivers refusing Asian passengers. Our state and local governments also have historically not done strong outreach to Asian American communities, 
leaving underfunded community-based organizations to fill the gap. And then looking at the broader picture, uh, we're fighting a racist history of immigration and labor policies in this country, starting um, and from back before the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Um, and we're also fighting a huge narrative war around um, where both major political parties in the US are using anti-China messaging as a way to respond to fears of a uh, declining hegemony. And so here in Chicago, um, and um, in the Midwest generally, we're focusing primarily on advocacy and organizing as solutions to some of these issues. Advancing justice works at the city, state, and regional level to build power through collective advocacy and organizing towards racial equity. Uh, we work on Im issues of immigration, uh, refugee rights, language access, democracy, and police accountability, and more. And through this COVID-19 crisis, we've pivoted more of our work towards supporting people and other organizations through the pandemic. We've been trying to gather resources for people, assist our partner organizations, and provide support for community members. But we've also had to pivot some of our work specifically to address the xenophobia and racism that is coming out of the pandemic. One example is that we are fighting it on a per interpersonal level with bystander intervention trainings. Uh, from what we learned after 9-11 and the discrimination that our Muslim, Middle Eastern, North African, and South Asian communities faced, we know that xenophobia is likely to be long lasting and completely unabashed. Um, and so we're investing a lot of time and effort into trainings that help people intervene in incidences of racial bias. We need people, um, all people who are both impacted and allies alike to intervene in moments of harassment before they escalate into violence. Um, and we're partnering with many organizations to do this and we know that we need to scale up very quickly. On a more institutional level, we're connecting agencies and organizations across Chicago so they can better serve a diverse Asian American community. We're asking state agencies and local governments to expand language access, as well as asking agencies to provide additional resources in language, increasing the number of languages for translation and interpretation, um, compensating community-based organizations uh, when they provide more services in culturally and linguistically competent ways. We hope that through this, we can make sure that immigrants and refugees of all origin can uh, access what they need to survive and not just Asian Americans. Um, and, and more on a structural level, we're really fighting from both the top and the bottom as well. Uh, we're working to pass legislation on the state level that would teach Asian American history in K through 12 education. The Teaching Equitable Asian American Community History Act, or TEACH, um, looks to educate youth on our collective history in the US. From Japanese internment um, to the refugee policy after the Vietnam War, we really need to inform the next generation of our past um, so we can re uh, not repeat our mistakes. Um, and besides our youth, we also need to hold the most powerful accountable as well. It has been all too easy, not only for the Trump administration, but also many top Democrats, including Joe Biden, to use deeply anti-Chinese rhetoric and thus put East and Southeast Asian Americans in great danger. Um, and we've been speaking to elected officials, writing um, op-eds and uh, speaking out against such hate-filled language whenever we can. But the last thing I'll mention is what uh, we think is most important in all of this work is that we're fighting for racial equity for all people um, and refusing to pit ourselves against other communities co of color in this crisis. We know that COVID-19 does not discriminate, but our society as it currently is does. Um, and that creates a lot of the inequalities that we see. We know that COVID-19 impacts different communities in different ways, but we are all fighting under systemic forces that oppress all of our communities. So in this time, we're working really hard to stay in solidarity with other communities of color as we fight xenophobia and racism um, and for the liberation of all people. So um, thank you so much for having me and I'll hand it back to you, Tracy. Thank you very much, Ms. Chu. So there really does seem to be a theme that's running through and it makes such perfect sense of solidarity and of standing together. We're now going to go to our first session of question and answers. Um, and then just to explain that we're then going to have another uh, couple, a handful of speakers, and then we will conclude with another um, uh, question and answer session. So if we don't get to answer your questions this time, don't worry, there will be an opportunity towards the end. And so just looking at some of the questions that have appeared, I'd like to um, ask our speaker, Craig uh, McIver, Mr. McIver, if I could ask you 
to speak to the first question, uh, which is as follows. What can be done concretely by regular citizens when heads of governments are inciting enmity through racial slurs? Uh, what can ordinary folk do and, and NGOs to push back against a climate um, that is encouraging racism and, and hatred? Over to you, Craig. Thanks, Tracy. That's a great question. I have to say that you know, you can't help but be concerned by this trend we've seen in recent years of a kind of normalization of bigoted speech by politicians and other people in the in the public eye. And I think the general answer is that we need to push back against that normalization to make it very clear that it's not OK to integrate these kinds of, of bigoted references into the speeches of heads of states, heads of government and, and other politicians. Speech has to be countered by speech. The silence in reaction to this is what allows its normalization. So I think in concrete terms, it means that we need to speak up. We need to demand equal time, which means approaching the media, um, for example, also using social media to try to uh, respond to these things, to organize um, uh, against those kinds of manifestations, whether that means actual organization when we're able or online organization and generally to push back against these things. You know, the easy answer is to vote them out. The problem is they're often replaced by others with the same inclinations if we don't tap down on this tendency more broadly in our societies. So counter that speech with speech everywhere that you can would be my answer. Thank you very much, Craig. I think in the interest of time, what we're going to do is we're going to move on to the next set of speakers and we will then address the remaining questions um, at the end of the session. Uh, a number of the questions that are coming through are quite similar. So what we may do is we may not necessarily uh, um, state exactly the words you have used, but if there is a similar, you know, we'll group the questions together. Thank you for bearing with us and, and uh, let's, let us move on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is Ms. Simona Cruciani. Simona serves as a political affairs officer at the United Nations Office on Genocide Prevention and the Responsibility to Protect, where she runs the global program with religious leaders on preventing incitement to violence that could lead to atrocity crimes. Ms. Cruciani is also the focal point for the implementation of the United Nations Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech. And I, I do believe that while uh, Ms. Cruciani is referring to uh, the document that she's about to introduce, you, will, you should see appearing links to these documents and that should be happening. If for some reason you're not seeing them on the chat board, please don't worry. At the, uh, all the links will be available on the Civil Society um, Unit's website at the end of the session. Uh, Ms. Cruciani, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy, and uh, for organizing this fantastic event and for Im inviting me to be a speaker of it. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the previous presentations are excellent. And uh, I don't have a lot to add, but uh, the, the reason that I wanted to, to be with you today is uh, in particular what you just mentioned, is to present uh, um, a policy document that uh, my office uh, has just released uh, a couple of days ago. Um, it, the, one of the uh, speakers mentioned at, at the beginning uh, of this event um, that the Secretary General exactly 10 days ago on the 8th of May published or, really, or launched a global appeal to address and counter COVID related uh, speech. And uh, in this global appeal, DSG denounced what is the current tsunami of hate speech, xenophobia, scapegoating and scaremongering unleashed by the pandemic. DSG re referred to many of the issues that we have been hearing uh, from my distinguished uh, uh, previous speakers today. He, he refers to anti-foreigner sentiments, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, anti-Muslim attacks related to COVID-19, but also attacks against journalists, whistleblowers 
and uh, and aid workers and human rights defenders, all, all people that were attacked for just doing their jobs. So three three days three days after the global appeal by the Secretary General, um, my office, which is the UN office on genocide prevention and the responsibility to protect, uh, published uh, the UN guidance to address and counter COVID related hate speech. The guidance is a public document and you can easily download it uh, uh, from our website uh, www.preventgenocide.un.org. I think uh, um, the main uh, the main uh, the main point uh, that the that the guidance uh, raises is that uh, COVID-19 uh, related hate speech is of course related to uh, the growing trends of misinformation and disinformation. However, this specific form of hate speech also stresses that more insidious forms of hate speech related to this pandemic are used to target already marginalized and discriminated against populations, including ethnic and religious minorities. I think Craig already um, made a very clear point about it. And we know also very well that uh, uh, COVID uh, related hate speech is, the, is advanced both uh, in mainstream and online media, often by private individuals. However, it becomes more dangerous when uh, politicians, civic or religious leaders or influencers spread it. Um, COVID related hate speech can have short and long term consequences, which include exposure to violence, isolation, marginalization, infringement of human rights, in particular uh, freedom of expression and access to, to health. So in a nutshell, it exacerbates existing discrimination, social and economic inequalities, drivers of violence and violent extremists, social cohesion and solidarity that is so needed right now, as we have heard already previously, to fight the pandemic. So basically, it's a threat to the three pillars of the United Nations, which are peace and security, human rights and development. My second point here is that the, the primary responsibility to address and counter hate speech, including COVID related hate speech, lays with the state. However, other actors also in the society play an important role. And that's why the United Nations guidance note to counter and, and address COVID related hate speech includes a series of recommendations further to, to, to governments and their institutions, also to media, civil society, religious and civic actors, influencers, and so on. And including to the United Nations fund programs and agencies, especially in their role of supporting the uh, member states and other uh, societal actors in fighting uh, this big challenge. I want uh, to make my last point that is that uh, this uh, guidance note is based on the wider UN umbrella strategy on countering and addressing hate speech that was released uh, uh, in June 2019 by the by the Secretary General. And therefore, as this uh, UN guidance, as uh, the UN strategy says, based on the overarching principle of international human rights law, also the COVID related guidance uh, on hate speech that we just released is based on the respect of international human rights standards and in particular freedom of opinion and, and expression. We just heard Craig um, who answered a, a question on how we can fight uh, hate speech simply with more speech with uh, reinforcing and strengthening freedom of opinion and expression. So I invite all of you to download uh, this guidance note and also and also to implement it. And uh, I would like to finalize my uh, remarks saying that as the United Nations uh, uh, Secretary General say many times, the pandemic can all only be defeated through enhanced solidarity 
e multilateralism. In the same way, we can only defeat the pandemic, uh, the virus of, uh, of, of hatred with more solidarities. As Craig said, and I quote him again, the solidarity is the back vaccine uh, for our brothers and, and sisters, in particular against the virus of hate speech. So I will stop here and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Cruciani. It's now my pleasure to welcome Ms. Judea Spencer, who is the Executive Director of the International Youth Leadership Institute. Ms. Spencer will share her personal experiences working on efforts related to COVID-19 and its impact on people of African descent. Ms. Spencer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you confirm that you can hear me? Wonderful. Okay, first of all, good, um, good afternoon. It was officially noon, happy noon and happy Monday to everyone. And thank you for um, making the time to have this conversation. Thank you for the invitation and thank you to the Department of Global C Communications for um, opening this dialogue and this forum. It's absolutely important um, as like those who've come before me in this conversation have underlined just how um, in addition to having to deal with this pandemic that we now have to also deal with the uh, pandemics of the mind as well. Um, thank you, Simona, for those like awesome points too. Um, I, as mentioned, I'm the executive director of the International Youth Leadership Institute, and so our uh, mission is to nurture a new generation of visionary leaders uh, with special focus in the African diaspora um, who, inspired by their rich African heritage, would be committed to leaving a legacy in the world. And so, like our whole vision is that every day. Youth are assuming leadership roles and making the world a better place wherever they are. And so uh, this uh, normally we uh, would be meeting with our students. We mainly work with high school and middle school students and normally we'd be meeting with them in person. Um, but because of this uh, global pandemic, one thing that I can say is that we stress when it comes to leadership is that we strive not to uh, see obstacles where we could see opportunities. So uh, we one thing that's uh, been one thing we are grateful for is that this COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic is happening during a time where we do have access or many of us at least do have access to uh, widespread Internet. Um, or to uh, video conferencing, even just about five or six years ago, um, the technology was not as advanced as it is today. And so like, that's something to um, absolutely be grateful for and also something to be mindful of as we uh, are striving, especially in the field of education, to ensure that all uh, students have access to some way to tap into the internet such that they can continue tapping into education. Um, because our population that we serve are also um, centered on uh, mainly like a youth of African descent, um, meaning like black youth, um, Latino youth, um, in particular here in New York City and also on the African continent, um, being able to shift to, uh, well, yeah, we have to also just like acknowledge like the context that we're also in. Um, one thing that like here in New York City where I'm based, I heard um, I heard um, Janice Mathis earlier speak to the fact that only in this country, in the United States, only one in five African Americans actually has a job that can be done from home. Um, whereas here in New York City, 75% of essential workers in New York are people of color, which is to say that in addition to the um, dynamics that we have to deal with now in terms of being concerned for our health, um, in protecting ourselves from this virus that we're still coming to understand. We know more about it than we did before, but even now we're still coming to understand it. Um, we have to be concerned about that. And as human beings, just on a purely human level, uh, in like the hierarchy of need, there's like food and clothing of shel and shelter. And there's also like this need for safety. So this great, tr like, this great transition into um, being like constantly aware of, you know, a possible biological threat also just like takes its mental toll. So uh, like the matter of mental health is definitely something that just needs to be underlined for us all, <laughs> especially um, not having access necessarily to being able to 
uh, step outside and roam or do the things that no people may normally be able to do um, in like times that are difficult. And so my hope is that this uh, experience will help us to have more empathy for those who are uh, in in you know in situations where there's not necessarily a consistent sense of safety about our brothers and sisters, our fellow human beings who are in conflict areas, our fellow human beings who uh, who have been dealing with this kind of uh, dynamic of just not being able to step outside and feel safe for quite some time. Um, and that also includes um, even within the United States to what I heard um, what I heard Craig speak to um, previously as well, um, just like this pandemic of uh, xenophobia as well, and how it's a lot to have to deal with to one, be concerned on a biological level about survival, and then also by virtue of the, uh, you know, just like more statistics, like here in New York City, we have more uh, cases of COVID in the city uh, than there are in like virtually any other state or in, in any other like, you know, state in the United States. Um, and what that also means is that like we have this uh, terrible uh, confluence of, confluence of the uh, disparities in terms of healthcare, which I heard someone mention earlier about how healthcare being like a human right. In addition to the, uh, like the magnifying effects of that and xenophobia and the fact that people who are in marginalized spaces, especially in urban areas, are just more uh, susceptible to having infectious disease. So what we do with our students is in like training for leadership and in our way to like try and address uh, trying to address this pandemic and just addressing like the world that we're in. If we say that we are to um, nurture leaders for the world, this world is like what it, it forces us to also ask ourselves, like, what does it look like to prepare um, youth, to prepare Black youth to be leaders in a world that is uh, increasing in its uncertainty, uh, increasing in its xenophobia, and uh, often also increasing in, in persecution. And so, um, you know, as I mentioned, like, since we're teaching our students not to um, see obstacles, but we can see opportunities, what we've had to do is, like, lead by example. Um, and so our students uh, all over the world are creating like various projects to just like improve and like move, continue to move forward with how they want to uh, establish their impact. Because uh, one benefit of um, having internet access, but also being forced inside, means that we uh, we are no longer bounded by geography in some senses too. Like, I, I'm not sure where everyone else is in terms of how you've been dealing with this pandemic, but the concept of time has gotten a lot more fuzzy, <laughs> as has the concept of geography. So uh, whereas previously our students may have been mainly focused in New York, we've also now had the opportunity to have people join our conversations from Senegal and Nigeria. We've shifted our topics to um, you know, talk about the things that will be necessary to empower our students to help save lives and help to just improve and protect the quality of their own life. So we held a session on pandemics and public health to, you know, based upon the information from the World Health Organization to empower our students to be able to go out and tell their community members. We have people in our community now who are COVID-19 trackers who are helping our city to move and understand like where this virus is going. We also had a session on emergency and disaster preparedness because um, at a time like this where uh, we're just in unprecedented times, it's also important to um, you know, plan for the worst and also hope for the best. Um, and lastly, we also just very recently had a session on uh, something that we don't usually discuss uh, with, uh, with a young population, which is um, you know, end of life planning. Not in the sense of, um, well, one thing that's also come from this, and I'm curious to see like how this impacts our society, is that unfortunately, um, as COVID spreads, it also means that uh, we as individuals get close, like are within like one or two or three degrees of loss as well. Like, of, like we either know someone, at least here in New York City, uh, many of us either know someone or know someone who has, uh, who knows someone else who um, has been impacted by COVID-19. And so how might we frame this from a space of, uh, from a thought of healing 
um, and from a, a desire to prepare and approach this with a matter of empowerment um, and the fact that we now get to explore new ways to celebrate each other and new ways to leave legacy um, that otherwise might have been uh, touched upon before this uh, pandemic had started. Um, that hopefully like this will also like create like more empathy like among our community as well. So like what does it mean to like take care of oneself? Um, and what does it mean for us to look out for each other even uh, in a time where there's just so much to um, come to know. And so like I found that this time has really forced us to uh, like be more creative in how we make those kinds of impacts and to really start to unpack like what we mean because like the, the stakes are so much higher than they might have felt like a few just a few months ago. Um, and so what I just end with is just saying that the um, as we're, continuing and as we're stepping further into this future, which is unknown, it becomes more and more important to create spaces where we can feel safe. And so that can mean like even just empowering like the people who are right next to you, that leadership is not necessarily um, being like the loudest person in any room, is not necessarily uh, like even being the person like the brightest ideas, but it might be like being the person who just like stops to listen, um, being the person who like checks on your neighbor to ensure that uh, people have what they need, especially looking out for those who are most vulnerable and most marginalized, because we can only judge a society based upon how the most marginalized are treated. And so if the most like and this also just goes back to the idea um, that you know, those of us who are essential workers who are right out here on the front lines right now, who are like protecting and supporting the rest of society, um, at least in the context of uh, where I live, are also those who are um, most vulnerable and who uh, whose lives really um, have to be taken into account. And that we can't say, for example, let's open up, you know, let's open up the city <laughs> or open up the countries where, when, in which we live. Um, if that means that we're putting certain lives at stake, like the value of a human life should not be de like dependent on the geography and the proximity to you, like where you live in a relationship to a certain border or an imaginarily drawn line should not determine whether or not your life has more or less value where like your bank account should not determine whether your life has more or less value. We as human beings are inherently valuable and so we need to generate and and foster and encourage and respect and encourage our colleagues, our neighbors, and our elected officials to also acknowledge and uphold that respect for life for us all. And I'm sending uh, hope to all of you as well that we can at least like within ourselves, like spark up those conversations and hold each other accountable for that value. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Spencer. You certainly gave us a lot to think about, and it's it's in, 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 very impressive with the way in which you are and your organization are actually encouraging uh, young leaders to do as much as think and speak, particularly at this difficult time. Our next two speakers are Dr. Schaffer and Mr. Shash, Shashi. Um, the World Health Organization has stated that medical experts are worried that stigmatization of one community would do great harm, making people fearful of being victimized, leading to concealment of cases and delays in detection. And our next two speakers will look at the stigmatization and discrimination faced by patients and medical professionals in the context of COVID-19. Our first speaker is Mr. Frank, uh, sorry, Dr. Franklin Schaffer. Uh, he is the international CEO and president of CFGNS International, uh, which is an internationally recognized authority on credentials evaluation and verification pertaining to the education, registration and lic licensure of nurses and healthcare professionals worldwide. Dr. Schaffer is um, an NGO representative at the UN, at the World Health Organization and the International Councils of, Council of Nurses. Following Dr. Schaffer, Sorry, Dr. Schaffer, we will have Mr. Nico Shashi, 
who is the program manager at the International Centre on Nurse Migration. Uh, Dr. Schaffer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tracy. It's a pleasure to be with everyone this morning or this afternoon. Uh, I just must say to you that I have been so impressed with those that have preceded me in the presentations today. They've been outstanding and I've learned very, very much and I appreciate it. Like many of us, we appreciate those who have gone before us and today is one of those fine examples for me. So I just would like to thank all of you. I'd also like to thank the organizers and uh, the technology support system that you have at the UN, and particularly on this uh, webinar today. I have the honor to represent uh, an organization of 220 individuals uh, in, located in Philadelphia today, as well as other offices around the world. And I have the wonderful opportunity also to co-share with Nico Sashi out of Italy, who will be talking today about more of what he has experienced in Italy and with that community. My goal today is to try to bring you up to speed with where we are in the world of immigration. With, uh, remember, it's not going to be a great in-depth presentation because time does not permit it. I would just like to say to you that we are the world's largest credentials evaluation organization. We work with 197 countries of the world. I am a nurse myself. I've been a nurse for 56 years and I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this profession from day one. I'd also like to thank all of you for inviting us into your homes on a 24 hour basis, whether on the news, where they're involved in uh, all the scenes that you've been witnessing with COVID-19, both the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've been there, and we've been there throughout our careers, all health professions. While we as nurses are, are at center stage right now, I think people are starting to realize that the world in which we live in and the world in which we work in is very different than what was thought of prior to COVID-19. The one thing as a nurse I'd like to say to all of you, if you just take a, uh, a time to reflect and to try not to think of us as heroes because that mar it conjures up the idea of a martyr. We're doing our job. We're doing what we've been prepared to do every day. And if, if you can listen to the stories that nurses and other healthcare professionals talk about on the TV, you're going to see the expressions of how we enjoy our profession. Uh, today, I'm going to take a few minutes just to talk to you about the, the perspective of the health worker as well as the uh, from the patient's perspective. Next slide. If you could, uh, I'm going to talk about the patients that are socially stigmatized due to public fear, rumors, misfortune, and about the disease. Also think about the isolation of these individuals, the mental health problems that they have once they've been hospitalized. Think about it once they go on to a ventilator and then come off of a ventilator and what they've gone through. Think about the family being isolated from them. They cannot have contact with them. Most of them don't have their cell phones with them, and those that are due are on ventilators frequently that are unable to talk. This is, an, an, it's been a life-threatening experience for them, and we've all been thrown into this such a situation very, very suddenly. But I cannot imagine, a friend of mine just passed away due to the COVID, and he was hospitalized, did not have a cell phone, and this is a, a, a friend of mine who was my professor, my mentor, and a friend for 42 years. That was an experience which I know was very difficult for him because he's a very gregarious individual, but just due to the isolation of alone, and the stigma that it puts upon all of those who were around him before he went into the hospital. They, we start questioning, what did I do with him? What did I do with her? And so on and so forth. I understand now one of the newest things that is just from talking to people, we can also uh, get the uh, COVID. The science behind it and the uh, our understanding of it must change every day as we must change with the way we change that we treat uh, fellow human beings. It really harms the people's health and well-being and can deprive individuals of all the necessary resources to care for themselves and their family during this pandemic. And this is this is across society. It varies uh, certainly upon the degree to access to care, et cetera. But it's affecting all of us around the world, whether you're a migrant, whether you're a healthcare worker, whether you're a patient or whatever. Each of us feel this or are associated with one way or another. If we're not, we have very close friends that have come in contact or are suffering from or have died. Health workers and particularly nurses have constantly cared for the similarity of, uh, of stigmatized patients diagnosed with leprosy, uh, HIV AIDS and now COVID-19. Even if you go back to the Spanish flu and how all that occurred. Throughout the years, nurses have been there. 
And I must say to you also, leprosy, while it's been seen as a, 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 a stigma, we have two nurses that were trying to, in, from Korea, that were trying to get recognized as a Pulitzer Prize winner uh, because they have worked with leprosy cases for their entire life. And they're two uh, phenomenal nurses that have given their life to care for these uh, patients who are very stigmatized. Next slide, please. Healthcare workers are on the forefront, the lines against, they're really on the front lines against COVID-19, face pathogen exposure, long working hours, psychological distress, fear, burnout, stigma, discrimination. Not only from others, but even from their own families, they have felt some of this. Think about it, you're working in a hospital or if you're caring for COVID patients, you go home, you have to isolate or quarantine away from your family and your friends. Think about it, if you're an individual nurse who's migrating from one country to another and you do this on a daily basis. When you come over, say to the United States, for example, you then are considered to be isolated for a while because you might be coming out of a, a COVID area. Then when you go back home, you're also going to have to uh, be quarantined for the number of days, again, away from your family. And all you're trying to do is earn a living for you and your family. Foreign educated uh, trained healthcare workers face stigmatization and xenophobia greater than any other group out there. If you look at it, the foreign educated healthcare professional cuts all races, gender, uh, and religion as well as ethnic groups. They cut across, so they feel it all. We started 42 years ago, almost 43, to, uh, to really help individuals who were trying to migrate to the United States, foreign educated nurses trying to migrate to the United States. And many of them had to come here. Their parents had to uh, take a loan or mortgage their home to afford for them to fly to the United States to take an examination, national examination. Many of them failed the exam. Many of them could not face their families because their families had mortgages have gone into debt to support them to come here. So there are a number of losses, a uh, number of suicides as a result of that. Also, the economic side it was very felt by employers, et cetera. So we were created to establish a predictor exam that they could take in their home country before they came here to give them an example how they would succeed on the NCLEX exam. And to this date, it's still one of our major things that is given around the world. And it does present an opportunity for anyone who desires to have a uh, career here in the United States or in Canada or in New Zealand. We do work with all three countries. We work with 195 countries of the world. And we have felt personally the, uh, some of the example, examples that have been given by my predecessors, we have felt that you had individuals texting us and saying, I want to come to the United States. Well, right now we can't help you as much as we'd like to because 167 countries of the world are closed. We can't get your documents. We can't get the uh, transcripts. We can't do any of these things that are absolutely necessary for us to evaluate you. So we, like other people, are adapting and making changes every day. So we're also fearful that when the countries do open up, our countries of the world are going to want to get are going to probably become more involved in brain drain than brain gain. So they don't are not going to want a lot of their healthcare professionals migrating to the world. Actually, in the very beginning of this COVID, one country closed their borders immediately to any migration, even though some people had uh, uh, had the uh, visas to come to the United States. So. It's affected healthcare professionals grossly. Now, if you look at, we're very concerned about the future. The future has already been predicted for us that we're going to be 9 million nurses short by 2030. We think that this is going to, the COVID is going to have a, a negative impact as well as a positive impact on recruiting healthcare professionals into the profession. Think about it. If you want to have the opportunity to possibly risk your, risk your life, as well as be isolated from your family and other things. But I do ask that you think about the foreign educator or the migrant who makes that journey from their home, leaving their family home behind, sometimes their own children, to migrate for a better world, for a better life, for a career, to afford, so they could afford a better life for their children. Think about the economic situation right now with the uh, re uh, remittance that's gonna be given to countries. Right now, we know that that's drying up very quickly. 
and that's going to have an economic effect on the other countries of the world. So if you look at the uh, the 20.7 uh, 20 million nurses and midwives in the world, which makes up 50% of the world workforce. Since 2011, 60% increase in the number of foreign educated workers in uh, OECD countries. Their new trends show that the migration has certainly changed, but most of the migrants are women. There are 258 international migrants, 120, 124 million are women, 36.1 are million children, 25.4 are registered nurses, 150,000, 150, million rather, are migrant workers and 150, 408 million are students, are international students. We've seen the student population drive very quickly. And what that's going to be like as we go down the forward, one is not sure. So the next slide, please. I've given you some data that probably you're saying, well, you ran through this too quickly. I can send that to, to Tracy, all right? So if you look at strategies for tackling tackling the signal. My co-presenters previously did talk about some of the strategies, but I think that we have to say that this should be a wake-up call for the world, not for just one country, but for the entire world. It, it should be a wake-up call for each and every one of us, thereby the grace of God go I. And I think that we must really take a good hard look at ourselves, our beliefs, our, and what we stand for as a society and as a person. Education is key. Public education and the facts surrounding COVID are necessary for curbing stigma of patients and healthcare workers. While here in our own country, we're seeing now CDC being challenged, that CDC is one of the most recognized educational forms and scientific uh, uh, branches of our federal government. And it, we've got to take also a self-reflection on our own biases and try to deal with those as much as we can. Advocacy, we at CGFNS cannot, uh, uh, encourage migration, but we do have the International Ethical Recruitment uh, Alliance, which really is to, to foster ethical recruitment practices. We work with the WHO and the U.S. Office of Global Affairs to ensure that the individuals coming to the United States are recruited ethically and hospitals in turn have the best possible best practices for onboarding them. It's all about advocacy, education, and most importantly, the collaboration among and across nations, peoples, organizations, and individuals. We all must do our part if we're going to make this a better world. And it's up to us to do that and the future generations that follow us. So I ask all of us to recognize the healthcare workers, to recognize those who are less fortunate to us, because we all owe it to one another to make it a better world. Thank you very much. Nico? Thank you, Franklin. I would like to thank the organizers, the UN Department of Global Communication team uh, for this opportunity and my fellow colleagues for your excellent presentations. Um, in Europe, hate speech, xenophobia and racism are not new phenomena, having been permeating for quite some time now, especially when it comes to the treatment of migrants. Uh, however, the, follow the following the spread of COVID-19, we witnessed an increase of violence and hatred towards the Chinese community, uh, including being barred from establishments. Uh, especially here in Italy, prominent figures in the Chinese communities warned of episodes of racism against their compatriots by Italians fearful of deadly virus as episodes during the beginning of the pandemic occurred. This included Chinese tourists being spat at in Venice, a family in Torino being accused of carrying the disease, and mothers in Milano using social media to call for Italian children to be kept away from Chinese classmates. In response, uh, local health officials sent the school's concerns a letter stating that there is no need to introduce measures restricting the presence of Chinese children within school communities, but it clearly is not enough. When it comes to healthcare workers in Europe, specifically in Belgium, UNIA, the Independent Center for Equal Opportunities, reported cases of carers who are asked not to park their car in the neighborhood and nurses who are required to wear gloves or even clean the building when entering. The reported cases of caregivers being encouraged to move as quickly as possible or even being evicted from their homes, as well as many documented cases of caregivers being stigmatized or even harassed by their neighbors and roommates. In France, the Prime Minister denounced discriminatory practices towards healthcare workers. After a case in Bretagne, a nurse claimed to have been evicted from her house because of her job. In Bayonne, a nurse arrived to her home after rendering her services of care and cure of COVID-19 patients just to find a letter in her door 
asking her to park her car away from the neighborhood and not to touch anything when she entered, while also asking her to move as soon as possible so not to put any tenants in danger. Here in Italy, Marco, a nurse, threatened by tenants of his building, when he entered, he's 42, year old, 42 years old and has been working for a nurse over 20 years. One evening when entering the entranceway of his condominium, he found a sign that stated, with your work, you make us sick with expletives. Another case of a nursing aide in the coronavirus department vilified in her apartment building. Posters inviting her to stay in a hotel or even sleep in a hospital saying, we do not want you here. You can bring us the virus. Lastly, a sign found in the entry of a doctor's apartment building saying, be careful when you return home, essentially threatening the doctor in the event a fellow neighbor were to fall ill. So what actions can we take? We need to raise awareness and counter all forms of disinformation, in particular racist and sexist responses to the pandemic. We need to support health systems and ensure access to health care for all, as health is a human right, regardless of resident status, race, nationality, language, or other factors. We need to promote cross-cultural skills and manage diversity, both in a professional and educational setting. And lastly, let us remember that only together can we defeat both the pathological virus, but also the age-old virus of racism, hate, and prejudice. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shashi. Uh, both um, for your for the examples that were very powerful. Thank you, Dr. Franklin, also for your input. I would now like to uh, present our last speaker, uh, who is Ms. Akshaya Kumar, who is the Crisis Advocacy Director of Human Rights Watch. Ms. Kumar focuses on global efforts to tackle racism, xenophobia and discrimination linked to the COVID-19 pandemic, and we'll discuss global action plans to counter intolerance. Ms. Kumar, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to the UN Civil Society Unit for creating space for this very important conversation. The event began with a reference to the importance of combating what was called the oldest hatred and educating people on the realities of the Holocaust. And so I wanted to start uh, with a quick reference to that because at Human Rights Watch, we're extremely sensitive to the acute need for this work, especially due to the risks presented by rising anti-Semitism. In fact, Israeli researchers have tracked a global trend of hate speech blaming Jews or Israelis for the spread of the coronavirus We've already seen a corresponding spike in hate crimes and anti-Semitism in Germany. And in the United States, comparisons are being made by those opposed to stay-at-home orders or social distancing measures, which include the very superficial arguments that strict public health measures are akin to genocidal dictatorships or the Holocaust. Governors have been linked to Nazis, and Alaska lawmakers suggested that wearing a sticker to enter a government building was being akin to being forced to wear the Star of David. And this rhetoric and discussion and vocabulary points for me to the really acute need, not just for a conversation about combating discrimination, but also for an understanding of what has come from the past. Because if we don't understand our history, we won't be able to learn from it. That said, the bulk of discrimination, hate speech, and violent attacks that we've seen globally, and our organization, Human Rights Watch, is a global uh, research organization focused on documenting violations of human rights. Have, and these incidents have focused on Asians or those who look Asian. For example, there were reports in late March in Sydney, in Australia, of cases in which death to dog eaters was painted in front of an Asian man's house. In another incident, people screamed racist abuse at two sisters, calling them Asian dogs who brought the coronavirus here. But it's not just Australia, as you know. In Russia, during the last week of February, well before Moscow was placed under lockdown, police raided several locations to identify Chinese citizens and force them into quarantine, regardless of their travel history or the risk they presented. Discrimination and hate crimes linked to COVID-19 have also targeted Asians in the Middle East, in Europe, including Sweden, uh, the Netherlands, and in Germany, uh, in the United Kingdom, and the United States. 
but it's important to note that we've also seen examples of discrimination against foreigners more generally, and in Cameroon, indeed, discrimination against visitors from the diaspora. As numerous other speakers have mentioned, in the United States, rhetoric focused on labeling the virus as either Chinese or Wuhan has corresponded with a spike of anti-Asian bias and hate crimes. In Hungary, the leader Viktor Orban has weaponized coronavirus to attack migrants and fuel xenophobia, suggesting that migrants spread the virus. In India, authorities have done very little to curb the spread of viral disinformation, which claims that minority Muslims are deliberately spreading the coronavirus. And as a result, anti-Muslim discrimination has rocked India, but also Sri Lanka and Cambodia. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has not explicitly condemned hate speech against Muslims, although he did tweet COVID-19 does not see race, religion, color, caste, creed, language, or borders before striking. Indian authorities at the national and local level still have not taken adequate steps to stem the increasingly toxic atmosphere around uh, Muslims and the attacks that are happening on Muslims, the limitations on Muslims being able to access adequate health care. And they have not conducted adequate investigations of the spread of disinformation. In contrast, in the United Kingdom, police forces are reported to have launched investigations into similar efforts by far right groups to smear Muslims there. A question came up in the chat, and I think it's important to address at Human Rights Watch, we have documented attacks on Africans in China. For example, Michael, a black Canadian living in China, said he was denied entry to the subway system for two weeks starting on April 10th. A metro station worker told him, as of this morning, we've been told not to let any black people onto the subway. And he explained to our researcher that the subway system doesn't seem to care about any documents or the status of his health code app, simply the color of his skin. In early April 2020, Chinese authorities in the southern city of Guangzhou in Guangdong province, which has China's largest African community, began a campaign to forcibly test Africans for their coronavirus and to order them to self-isolate or quarantine in designated hotels. There was no evident scientific basis for this policy. Most imported cases of COVID-19 to that province were Chinese nationals returning from abroad rather than Africans. And many Africans had already tested negative for the coronavirus. They didn't have a recent travel history and they had not been in contact with known COVID-19 patients. Nonetheless, the action of authorities resulted in ripple effects. And so landlords evicted African residents, forcing many to sleep on the street. Hotels, shops, and restaurants refused African customers. It's important to note that in this province, other foreign groups were not subjected to similar treatment. Human Rights Watch has found this isn't simply a case of racial or ethnic discrimination. We've also seen discrimination against the LGBT community. For example, in South Korea, the LGBT community is being unfairly ac accused of spreading COVID-19. This backlash illustrates the need for governments to move proactively to stop the scapegoating of minority groups as the pandemic continues. In South Korea, what happened is the government began to relax restrictions, and in the following days, dozens of new COVID-19 cases appeared, some linked to nightclubs, uh, where authorities estimated that almost 5,000 people had been exposed to the virus. Since the media initially described those nightclubs as gay clubs, a firestorm of online harassment and intimidation targeting LGBT, LGBT people in South Korea ensued. Additionally, due to the virus's disproportionate impact on older people, we've seen the rise of ageism and age-based discrimination as well. Hate-filled memes like Boomer Remover have been trending on social media, and public officials have amplified an attitude that older people are dispensable. For example, in Texas in the United States, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick defended President Trump's push at the time to reopen businesses by saying, let's get back to living. The 70 year old said no one had asked him if he was willing to risk his survival in order to save the American economy. But he said, if that's the exchange, I'm all in. In Brazil, President Bolsonaro has openly rejected the government's duty to protect older people. Instead, he said each family has to protect its elderly and not throw that on the state. 
Instead of projecting concern, broadcasting solid information and directing life-saving aid, President Bolsonaro has dismissed the value of older people and others at high risk. And worse, he's gone against medical advice and suggested that only older people should stay at home while others can go out, go and come from work. I would like to close with a recognition of the intersectionality or the double discrimination that we're seeing in some of the cases of hate crimes and hate speech. Civil society groups in multiple countries who are tracking the spike of discriminatory acts have told us that women are often two times more likely to be victims of these hate crimes. And so we see an intersection there of gender based violence with the type of issue that we're discussing today, which is hate crimes. So I'd like to close with a call to action. The UN committee responsible for monitoring compliance with the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which 182 countries have ratified, has recommended that governments adopt national action plans against racial discrimination. This committee recommends that the plans lay out specific approaches to combat racism and discrimination from enhanced policing of hate crimes to public messaging, to education programming and encouraging tolerance. In recognition of the gravity of this crisis at Human Rights Watch, we are recommending that governments update or adopt new special COVID action plans to address the wave of COVID-19 racism and xenophobia. The UN High Commissioner of Human Rights outlined in 2014 some best strategies and practices for adopting these kinds of action plans in a set of guidelines. And one important element of these guidelines that I think is especially relevant for this audience is a suggestion that the government hold an initial national consultative meetings or series of meetings to obtain input from various interested groups, especially civil society, to encourage broader understanding and acceptance of this action plan. We believe that such consultations are crucial for the credibility and effectiveness of these plans, and in fact that civil society can play an important step in urging governments to adopt these special COVID-specific anti-racism and xenophobia action plans. The broader the consultations, the more effective and long-lasting these plans' outcomes will be. And so I'd like to close with that ask that U.S. civil society take it upon yourself to lobby government, whether at the local level, the state level, the provincial level, or the national level, to develop an action plan to best respond to the many issues which the speakers have discussed today, and to find a way to move forward so that we can combat these issues. Thank you. Akshaya, thank you very, very much for your uh, incredible uh, presentation in that it really brought our focus back to the global uh, world and how this has impacted everyone everywhere. I think also in your presentation, you may have addressed some of the questions that have been uh, that have been sent through to us. And so thank you very much. On that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are running slightly over time, but we feel that if you can bear with us and please do stay with us, we would like to look at some of the questions that um, have come through and, and allow our speakers to address them. After that, we have a short, very short survey that we would like you to uh, complete and then we will say goodbye. I also wanted just to raise the fact that Dr. Schaffer's PowerPoint and any, and any, um, any of the PowerPoint presentations that you have seen will be available on the Civil Society Unit website. Let us go across to some of the questions and, and, and some of the questions are in fact very similar. The first person I'm going to ask to address uh, one of the questions is uh, Mr. McIver. And one of the questions was really asking around what is it, what are the UN mechanisms in place to hold governments accountable for reigning in uh, hate speech essentially, incitement and, and encouraging conspiracy theories. That's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is how effective are these measures? So uh, Mr. McIver, if I can hand it over to you, if you would be able to um, shed some light on that question. Sure. Well, specifically on the issue of hate speech, I would encourage people and uh, Simona knows a lot about this because her office is coordinating this initiative across the UN system, which is the Secretary General's system wide strategy on combating hate speech. And you can find that on the UN website and a lot of good guidance that uh, Simona and her colleagues have uh, have put together. And I, I don't know, she may want to say something on that. 
more broadly to the question, I would say that what we're seeing is that this pandemic is uh, being used as a kind of a curtain behind which to ramp up repression and persecution and abuse against communities that have been long subject to that kind of abuse. We're seeing it all across the globe. Uh, one of the questioners mentioned the Rohingya, that's for sure, Palestinians, people of African descent in Asia, in North America, uh, in, in Latin America as well. And, and, and since that curtain is the enemy in all of this and the abuse of emergency measures uh, in the name of the pandemic, the challenge is to pull back that curtain and to shine as much light as we possibly can on the abuses, um, the abuses that are, are taking place. And that's where the UN mechanisms can be really helpful. If you go to the website of the UN Human Rights Office, www.ohchr.org, we'll put it in the, uh, in the chat box, you will see that there are a whole range of independent human rights mechanisms that are open to concerns from civil society, special rapporteurs on racism, on religious intolerance, on a range of other issues, commissions of inquiry that are mandated to investigate particular situations, some of the treaty bodies that we just heard mentioned, including the Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination. All of these mechanisms are looking very closely at the situation of human rights, of discrimination, of hate speech, of abuse that are happening behind this curtain uh, of the COVID response. Uh, the Universal Periodic Review, you know, a review of the human rights record in all states. These, none of these have what you would call enforcement power to answer the questioner's uh, query. But what they can do is to help to shine that public light. They can help to mobilize government action. They can help to mobilize moral and political suasion over states um, uh, who are engaged in these kinds of activities. And that kind of pressure becomes very important. So absolutely encourage our civil society partners to check all of those out uh, as tools that can be used. And at the same time, they can have a look at the dedicated COVID-19 webpage that's on the UN Human Rights site, uh, a click rate right from the homepage that'll bring them to a lot of tools on how to address all of these various threats and, and how we can build the kind of solidarity that I, uh, that I mentioned before. So definitely take a look at www.ohchr.org. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you very much for that uh, rich response. We'll go to a second set of questions which really speak to um, what resources are available, uh, particularly in working with younger people around um, ways of building their resilience and building their ability to respond when faced with uh, expressions of xenophobia, not necessarily directed only at them, but possibly to their, fear, uh, to their friends or uh, classmates. And of course, not only xenophobia, but any expressions of, of hate speech. Um, and so to address uh, these, we are going to ask first, Akshaya, if you would if you would give us some feedback and then we will go to Andrea and then to Jadea to 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 share with us some of your um, suggestions. Uh, Akshaya. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I would just reinforce uh, the idea that I closed my presentation with, which is the importance of civil society playing a role in the development of national action plans and also in encouraging states to take up this issue and to really think critically about what more governments should be doing to combat the spread of hate speech and discrimination, because uh, there is a part of this that is about each individual. It's about solidarity. It's about our feelings inside ourselves. But there's also a state responsibility, a responsibility and obligation of governments to stand up for victims and to prevent this scourge from spreading. Uh, and these action plans are a key part of that. I would also like to direct young people to our website, hrw.org. No. We have a special section dedicated to COVID-19 with daily updates from around the world about how this pandemic is playing out in different societies. And I think it's incredibly insightful to be able to read about the challenges people in different contexts are going through when dealing with this pandemic. It offers perspective, it gives us best practices or better practices, and it also gives us a sense of understanding that all of us around the world are dealing with this very similar challenge. So our website again is hrw.org. Thank you.
And now we will go to Andrea. Thank you. Uh, yes, I just want to also echo what Akshaya says that I think it's really important um, in this moment to empower people to demand more from um, their local and federal governments at this time um, uh, to use the power that exists there um, to fight the xenophobia and racism that is uh, happening right now. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to bring up um, is that for uh, Asian Americans in the States, um, our affiliation has a hate tracker where you can report incidences of hatred at standagainsthatred.org. Um, and one of the things that our community really knows is uh, data is super important and to be able to point to the different incidences of hatred is really important to being able to uh, counter it. The other thing that I wanted to mention also is that um, many of the speakers today talked about standing in solidarity with other people and also um, uh, standing up against incidences of hate that they see. And so for um, Advancing Justice Chicago, we're looking at bystander trainings as a piece of this. And um, for young folks especially, I think it may be very difficult to um, figure out how exactly to intervene in those instances. And so um, I wanted to share that there are lots of resources on bystander intervention um, and conflict de-escalation that are out there and to look up um, local instances of those sorts of trainings because we really don't want um, uh, young people to put themselves in a situation that could put them in further danger um, if they're uh, witnessing a, a, an incident of, of violence. And we want people to feel uh, comfortable and equipped um, with training to be able to intervene in those instances. And those trainings do exist. So um, we know that it can be really difficult to um, uh, <laughs> prepare yourself, you know, mentally, mentally and physically um, for intervention, but um, there are lots of ways to get more information on that. Um, and so um, I'll just uh, pass it back. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Andrea, for bringing up those points. Like, absolutely. Um, there's just so many, there are many different levels of accountability. And that's like what's something I wanted to touch on as well, just as far as, you know, what can we as young people do? Um, you know, to Akshaya's point, like there, we still like live in, in countries that are, are responsible for upholding like the respect for human life. And so, um, you know, like our government officials are still in fact like reachable by like phone. Um, but then even in addition to that, there's also just like community organizing as well. So like the fact that many of us are indoors uh, doesn't mean that we can't continue to advocate. Honestly, on the individual level, even simple things like just sharing more information, sharing more resources, calling out um, calling out occasions when you do see um, discrimination or like calling people in. So there is like a difference between calling people out and calling people in and calling people out sometimes is necessary. So calling people out is like, <laughs> like accountability that says like, hey, this is not right. Um, and also like not even based upon facts. Um, but then calling people in is also, you know, sometimes it's, it's difficult to say to your own family members that they're being like discriminatory. And sometimes calling people in is saying in like a, you know, saying even gently that, um, you know, there are some things just like statistically, this is, uh, statistically there's are, uh, there, are, there are facts and then there's xenophobia and the two are like very separate, but like starting those conversations with your own family um, like that on its own can like go like a long way as well because a lot of the instances that um, I heard um, Mr. Shasi bring up as well, Nico, is that like uh, the aggressions are like individual, like person to person, and the more we can, like the the way to decrease the uh, likelihood of those things happening is helping people to see sameness in one another and feel a sense of commonality. And so usually like we're better place to start than with your own friends and family as well. Um, we at the International Youth Leadership Institute, I'll put our um, website in the chat as well, like our students who are all like, creating various projects to um, work on different things. Try applying like your own passion and your own goals like toward like helping the people who are around you and the people around the world as well. We have, for example, like young people who love to sew and love fashion who have now applied that skill toward making masks for the community. We have people who love like graphic design who are now making graphics around like how to protect yourself in like a, a time of, you know, pandemic, how to like how to call people in 
when it's time to uh, when it's when you're in a moment where you observe like aggressions happening. Um, and lastly, uh, so question should I? There's also I saw this question about like um, how NGOs can work together. Should should I like touch on that as well? Question mark or uh, are we holding that off? Question mark. Okay, got you. So um, yeah, in that case, yeah. So I'll put like our website in the in the chat. But at the end of the day, yeah, like there's still like much that we can do, um, even from like the comfort of our ho own homes. And we should be taking advantage of that. Thank you very much, Jadea. Uh, and what Jadea has also pointed out again is that this is a conversation and it's not going to end now and we will carry on speaking to one another and supporting one another. The third question I'm going to turn to Simona <coughs> to address. Uh, and so, uh, Simona, if you could please talk to us about some of the ways in which civil society organizations could look at actually impacting on structural change. I'll hand it over to you. Sure, Tresvi, can you hear me? Tresvi, can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. okay, great. Um, thank you, I, I, will be, I will be brief. Uh, uh, I know that we, we are already a little bit over time, so I will refer again to two policy documents that we have at the United Nations. The first one is the UN Strategy and Plan of Action on hate speech. And, uh, and despite this being an internal document uh, uh, that is supposed to enhance the, the, the work and the coordination among UN entities on combating hate speech, one of the main commitments that is based on is the, the commitment of the United Nations to enhance its partnership uh, with various actors, including with civil society in the fight against uh, um, again hate speech so my first point would be really announce the the collaboration between the united nations and the civil society um, on this uh, on this subject the second document that i uh, i refer to is the un guidance uh, on combating uh, covid related hate speech and this this document uh, includes very specific recommendation on how uh, to work with uh, with civil society, which include um, uh, civic and political leaders and in influencer, and especially especially uh, in terms of uh, um, engaging um, on uh, on responses that uh, uh, involve the most affected communities, and also working at the very root causes of hate speech uh, and COVID-related hate speech. So um, these are two important documents that uh, entail uh, responses to this question. And I invite all of you to download them and read them and implement them. But then um, on this last point, uh, let me also tell you that uh, together with uh, the High Commissioner of Human Rights, uh, the Alliance and the Alliance of Civilization, we are organizing on 28th of May a virtual online consultation with religious leaders and actors and faith-based organization on a global pledge for action uh, to enhance collaboration to combat uh, COVID uh, uh, and uh, uh, its challenges, including those that are related to hate speech. So the result of this uh, consultation uh, is gonna be a series of uh, practical um, project and activities that will be implemented together with religious leaders and actors because they are uh, an essential uh, element in the fight against the, the COVID. The SG has reiterated in his message on the 11th of April, encouraging a, a stronger engagement with religious leaders and actors and faith-based or organizations in this regard. Over. Thank you very much, Simona. Our last question I'm going to place to uh, Mr. Brej, Jeff, uh, and really that just had to do with a question around what is available, what information does the UN share around COVID, um, and particularly looking at the, the um, inequalities that are reflected 
in the um, way that COVID-19 is expressing itself. Uh, Jeff, I, I'm just checking that, you're, that you are with us and able to take the, the question. Ah, all right. Well, um, that is a question that is a very good one and we will post an answer. I suppose the first, uh, Jeff has, has just left us briefly. Uh, the first answer would be to obviously address the and look at the WHO website. Um, we're also going to be place, um, posting a number of uh, connections to the SG, the Se Secretary General's page that will um, also address uh, that question. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for, for staying with us. We've had the most extraordinary panel of, of experts speaking and addressing the various issues that we were hoping we would cover today. Please, would you, um, as you can see, we have put up a link to a survey. Um, it will really help us going forward. Um, and if you could please just take a minute or two to download the link uh, and, and answer it. I believe it's also being shown in the uh, chat board. You can just click on that uh, and I will give you a few minutes, just a minute or two to do it. It's really very, very brief. Um, and then just to take the opportunity to remind you that a recording of this will be available on the website. Uh, all the material that you have seen, the uh, various web addresses that our speakers have indicated to you to find resources. We will also make sure that those are reflected on the Civil Society Unit website. Give us a few days, obviously, to get all of that uploaded. And I think we will now, uh, I think we will bring this uh, wonderful discussion to a close. I also want to remind you that there is the uh, Civil Society Unit um, research survey that Jeff mentioned at the beginning and the address for that again will be available on the website and and there it is um, help fight misinformation about COVID-19. Both surveys you are welcome to we would love it if you could please complete the survey related to today's discussion now and the other survey um, you can do if you have time now but um, if you could do that in, say, the next few days, that would be wonderful. It is now my absolute pleasure to thank you for your time, to thank our speakers, each one of whom made an invaluable contribution to today's discussion, to thank the Civil Society Unit and the team for inviting uh, the education outreach colleagues from the Holocaust and United Nations Outreach Program and the Remember Slavery Program. And of course, thank you to you to the civil society organizations for the extraordinary work that you do to keep our civil society vibrant, resilient and compassionate. Thank you and goodbye.